Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar, Software Defined Storage, Reality or Hype, with TBR Senior Analyst Stanley Stevens. I'm Justin Surgent and I'll be hosting today's session. Insights from today's presentation are from TBR's data center research team. If you'd like to learn more about this research, the research they conduct, or the products we offer, please reach out to Stan or myself after the webinar. But before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover. First, I'll be recording today's session and posting it on our YouTube site, TBRI channel. We encourage you to visit this channel to watch this presentation or any of the previous presentations we've posted. Second, I will be following up with all of you via email tomorrow afternoon with the link to today's recording as well as with the slides from today's presentation, so be on the lookout for that. And finally, we welcome questions from the audience on the material we're presenting today. Please send any questions you have to the Q&A function, preferably not the chat function as it's easier for us to sort them out here. We will address as many as we can at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand this over to Stan. Thanks, Josh, Justin, appreciate it. Uh, hello, everyone, thanks for joining today. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, cover what we're gonna uh, talk about today in today's webinar. Uh, five key areas that I'm gonna talk about. The first one is what is software-defined storage? The second is separating the hype from reality. Where are we today? Where are we heading? Where do we need to get to? What are the components of software-defined storage? How are vendors delivering software-defined storage today? And when do we reach Nibbana? When do we reach heterogeneity? When do we really reach the end line? So those are the five areas that I'm gonna to cover today. And before I get into what is software-defined storage, let me just give you a quick snapshot of kind of the market overview. And certainly software-defined storage is still in the early adopter phase. We see software-defined storage as gaining some market traction in specifically the cloud and hyper-converted infrastructure arena. Um, certainly for these vendors, for the cloud providers, for the hyper-converged infrastructure vendors, software-defined storage makes sense. As they look at alternatives like commercial off-the-shelf storage as a key enabler for them, they're leveraging software-defined storage to provide that management layer uh, for those solutions. And especially as customers are looking for cost-effective alternatives, or cost-efficient alternatives to traditional storage, you know, not only cloud providers and hyper-converged infrastructure vendors, but also enterprise vendors that might be looking at uh, architectures that are being driven by flash, if you will. Um, again, software-defined storage really helps with driving uh, down the cost of those types of infrastructures. But certainly as we take a look at it, there are kind of three things that are kind of preventing uh, immediate traction. I mean, certainly it's gaining traction in those areas I just mentioned, but certainly as we look at, as I mentioned a minute ago, enterprise. Enterprise is looking for cost-effective alternatives. You know, one struggle that they're having is their networks are very complex. If you look at a typical enterprise network, it not only encompasses multiple storage types, network attached, direct attached, and storage area networks, but it also includes multiple disparate storage platforms, whether it comes from the same storage vendor or whether it comes from multiple vendors. You know, these networks are very, very complex to manage and maintain. And when we take a look at software defined, uh, it's not really plug and play today for these types of environments, for these environments when we look at software defined, uh, there's a lot of history of these customers in these types of environments requiring professional services, professional services to provide upfront assessment and planning, you know, especially as it relates to how you're gonna handle some of the storage management tasks uh, that you face day to day, whether it's around provisioning or whether it's around protecting. Um, so certainly one of the key inhibitors right now is, is the fact that with software-defined storage, in a lot of cases, you know, there's professional services that's required in order to, for those to be successful in those more complex environments. You know, the other area is around the notion of heterogeneous storage environments and the fact that with software-defined, at some point, certainly it's going to uh, provide those capabilities, but again, today, We've got the issue of software-defined handles the management and orchestration. When you get down to more array-based or device-based tasks, tasks that are normally accomplished through the OS or firmware, 
things like volume creation, rate assignment, provisioning, things of that nature. Certainly you still require those. Uh, you still require access into the array or into the appliance, if you will, into the firewall, if you will, to handle those type of tasks. Now certainly we've seen vendors uh, making inroads into addressing this, but again, for the most part, I'm just giving you a broad view of what the market looks like from a software-defined storage perspective. And I think the last inhibitor at this point, even with the traction that it's gaining, um, is the fact that you know, with, without any clear standard or without any clear uh, definition for software-defined storage, customers, partners, the market as a whole is very confused around what is software-defined today. So let me boil back up to, so with that being said, why is software-defined getting traction amongst cloud and, and hyper-converged? Well, certainly, you know, if you take a look at some of the hyper-converged infrastructure vendors, they actually started as software-defined storage companies, and they evolved and moved over into the hyper-converged infrastructure space. So for them, they're going into environments where they're needing to only have to worry about managing uh, that bundle, if you will, or that stack, if you will, and for them, it's not a lot of worrying about the other additional complexities. So certainly, from that perspective, uh, there, there's credence as to why they're gaining traction uh, in those specific areas. If we kind of move to the next slide, and I just want to talk about before we get into what is software defined, I gave you a market overview as to where we are today. Let's just take a step back and kind of look at how we got to where we are. And when we take a look at the 90s, certainly networks back then were based on client server architectures, a lot of file sharing, a lot of physical hardware. Uh, from a storage perspective, reliance on uh, direct attach, network attach, fiber channel, storage area networks, if you will, and everything was distributed from a management perspective. And as we moved into the early 2000s, we migrated to desktops and laptops and cell phones. And a lot of, or not a lot, but you had some early adoption uh, with the enterprises of going towards virtualization. And when I'm talking about virtualization, you know, it's three things. It's server virtualization. It's some very early adoption around uh, desktop virtualization. And it's also the movement of, of storage vendors to move towards something called storage virtualization, which we'll talk about a little bit further in the presentation. But those are keys because, again, as the enterprise data center started to move from more from siloed to more of a virtual or more of a, a consolidated type of environment, bringing forth all of those capabilities, you were hoping that you were going to kind of break down the silos, but what happened is you created a lot of sprawls, you created a lot of silos. Um, and so, you know, as we continue to move forward into the mid-2000 and 2015, you know, the networks became more and more complex. Add now the migration of tablets and smartphones, and the enterprise is becoming more and more mainstream virtualized and moving into some early adoption around cloud, whether it's on-prem private cloud or moving towards some of the public cloud environments. Also in, two, in the mid-2000s and even into 2015, you had a, a, uh, a spree of consolidation amongst some of the vendors in the storage space. When you look at some of those acquisitions back in the mid-2000s, whether I reference Dell with Equalogic and Compellent or I reference HP with uh, three-part and left hand, a lot of that consolidation, again, when you're taking a look at what the data center infrastructure is addressing from a transformation perspective, now you've got additional complexities as you've got the vendor consolidation going on. And then furthermore, you've got some other challenges of you continue to consolidate, you're looking at convergence, you're looking at unifying your storage, you're looking at trying to be able to manage both file block, you also have some, some emerging storage types coming out like object in the mid-90s and, and kind of going loud and then quiet again and going a little bit loud again most recently and some of the activities around object storage. And then in this time frame in the mid-2000 to 2015, this trend of software-defined storage came about. You have early adopters adopting software-defined storage. Again, for us, we see a lot of it uh, within cloud providers. A lot of your hyper-converged infrastructures are utilizing software-defined storage. Yes, you have some enterprises and some of the vertical markets utilizing it, but for the most part, it's really being utilized within the cloud and hyper-converged space. As we move forward, 
the network will just become more and more complex, but yet it's going to leverage, you know, the movement towards sensors and Internet of Things. You'll bring in more mainstream cloud. This notion of really leveraging commercial off-the-shelf hardware and hyper-converged infrastructures, and all of that is going to put more pressure on really making sure that you have management infrastructures in place like software-defined storage and even software-defined IT as a whole that can go out and manage uh, these infrastructures. So with software-defined, especially software-defined storage, what are the facts? Well, one fact is, as I mentioned earlier, there is no clear standard. And that in itself creates a challenge. You've got varying definitions out there today. You've got, uh, you've got the vendors that are forming their own definition as to what a software-defined platform is, uh, whether it solely sits on commodity, whether it's part of uh, helping a legacy environment. You certainly have uh, organizations like uh, SNEA that have a definition. They have a framework. You know, they define it at a very high level as the abstraction and simplification of network storage and management. You know, I think another couple other facts on this is when you take a look at the evolution, when you take a look at all the activities that happened back in the 2000s, and you take a look at the, the latter part of 2010 to 2012, you know, you can also point to you know, the evolution of some of the software companies, whether it's Microsoft or whether it's VMware, with Microsoft releasing storage bases as part of Windows Server 2012 or, or VMware with VASA, you know, certainly those initiatives were also driving more towards uh, this, uh, this emergence of software-defined storage. But today, there is no true definition. We'll get into a moment uh, what our definition is for software-defined storage. The goal certainly is to provide heterogeneous multi-vendor management, you know, management of legacy, management of commodity. Again, being able to provide that single pane of glass across these complex networks. And again, to us, it's, it's, and we'll talk about this in a minute, it's not just at the highest level. If you think about managing storage and managing the data and being able to move that data, that should be part of the goal as well. What are the challenges? Well, one challenge, as I mentioned earlier in the overview, is the back-end planning. There is still a lot of back-end planning and administration that's still required. Again, you know, our assessment of the market as we talk to customers and, and partners, you know, for a lot of the complex networks, this holds true. And there is a lot of professional services that needs to be required in order to tune these and make them work in your more complex environments. The notion of firmware, firmware is still required, so certainly the OS. And again, if it's a commodity, that's not an issue. But if you go into a legacy, then what control do you have over the device's firmware? How are you going to be able to get into the data path? You know, ROI, depending on, again, the complexity of your network, can take, you know, a multitude of years before you actually uh, receive that, uh, that return on investment. And certainly the rising cost and controls that impact OPEX and COPEX, there's certainly a component of this. So you have to take a look at overall, if you're not going to bring professional services into this, then what is going to be the impact to both your operations and your capital expenditures? So what is software defined to, to TBR? Well, certainly it, it's very parallel to what SNEA starts with, which is it stores virtualization that abstracts the hardware and the software components. So it could be a, a piece of software that sits on commodity. It can sit on an appliance. Um, it, it can certainly uh, aid solutions like hyperconverged infrastructure or cloud storage. But here's the key. For us, it provides not only the management and orchestration of storage, but also the policy management. So getting down into the data set and being able to move the data between disparate platforms and disparate storage types. So across file, block, and object, across legacy SAN or NAS or DAS or even commodity or commercial off-the-shelf hardware. Um, the intent here, again, is to make this so it's a lot more economical, a lot less complex, for customers, and if you take a look at your enterprise customers today, how many of them have disparate storage platforms across their infrastructure? And I think at the end of the day, this is exactly what they're looking for, um, as well as all the other capabilities that are built into the definition as it relates today and as we see it today. 
So now that we've defined software defined storage, kind of let's get a grasp on it and just go through at a quick high level some of the common components and challenges. I mean, to me, when you take a look at it, a storage device, an appliance, what have you, is, is an enclosure, it's controllers, it's fans, it's power supplies, it's disk drives. You've got that for SAN arrays, you've got that for NAS appliances, you've got that for direct attached storage and commercial off the shelf. Um, you have the common components there. Um, what you have from a storage or a NAS perspective is you have the GUI, the array firmware. In a lot of cases, you'll have your host tools, so you'll have integration in the Microsoft or VMware environments or Citrix. You'll leverage storage virtualization so that when you're scaling and you're adding additional arrays, um, or you want to unify your storage and add firewalls and, and arrays at the same time, you can certainly do those and manage those from a single pane of glass. And you'll be able to provision, you'll be able to assign ACLs, you'll be able to create volumes, you'll be able to snapshot and provision and, and move and replicate um, and do all of that. I mean, the big difference between that and the traditional DAS and, and commercial off-the-shelf is You've got the GUI, you've got the array firmware, you've got the storage features. You're not so much going to have the host tools unless they're built into the software-defined storage or they're built into the storage management. Uh, same thing with the virtualization, unless it's built in, you're not going to have that. So again, I point that out just to make sure that uh, for those people that think those are built in, it really depends. Um, so the common challenges uh, with these architectures, whether you're talking about NAS, DAS, or SAN, is again, the creation of silos. I talked about the vendor consolidation and the disparate platforms and the fact that you have multiple management platforms. How we, how we got to where we are today with software-defined storage, well, certainly you have specifications that helped with SMP and SMIS. Certainly you have APIs out there and you have initiatives like Storage Spaces or VMware's VASA. Um, certainly what's driving all this is the market shift away from uh, hard disk drive over to flash, over to commodity or commercial off the shelf, uh, to converged and hyper-converged infrastructures, and really providing all those because it's required to handle trends and address trends like big data, Internet of Things, and cloud apps. So again, when we take a look at it, this and we par it down and we just take a look at kind of some of the subtle differences, it really boils down to, again, making sure that from a storage management perspective, you have the ability to handle not just the orchestration and management, but also down into the, the data path, and that you're leveraging and you're able to provide the host tools to provide that next level of integration, uh, as well as the fact that you're, you're virtualized uh, from a storage management perspective. So let's separate the hype from reality. Again, I mentioned earlier, without a clear definition, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, confusion out there today. So the first question is, can SDS manage heterogeneous environments? Again, from our perspective, based on our research, the answer is no. I mean, most SDS platforms today, um, whether it's coming from, let's start with the storage hardware vendors, it's really limited to their platforms. Yes, I, I'm not trying to offend anyone on the call, but certainly we understand that there's going to be support outside of the specific platforms that are supported today. Um, but certainly, you know, when I take a look at those and I look outside of just what the vendor has for support of their own and looking at third party, that's where the whole question of professional services comes into play. That's where a lot of the back-end planning has to happen when you're going outside of a single vendor world into a heterogeneous world. Um, so it's not, it's not seamless today and it's not easily plug and play today. So that leads me to my second question. Is SDS plug and play easy to deploy and manage? No, in most cases, again, it provides, you need a lot of the back end assessment, planning and measurement in order to do that. Um, and again, it's, there is some evolution going on out there as far as trying to bring these platforms uh, more and more closer uh, to be uh, easily deployable, but today there still is a lot of back end that's required. Can SDS support basic storage functions like LUN creation, rate assignment, and provisioning? Again, I want to separate. I mean, certainly on the commercial off the shelf, certainly the abilities are there. I'm talking about when you get into a true heterogeneous environment, um, you don't have those capabilities today unless you have uh, integration into the, into the OS. Uh, for that distinct legacy environment. So 
from our perspective, no, it still relies on the firmware. The firmware still provides those basic uh, capabilities. Um, and then certainly until that happens from a legacy perspective, you're going to have those issues. And again, I just want to point out that unless you have deep integration with APIs, certainly open source is going to help with some of this. But again, ask the question, will open source help you down to, to that level across a heterogeneous or a legacy environment? So now let's look at the components of software-defined storage from TBR's perspective. Certainly, we believe that the vendors need to integrate hardware, software, and services to address the market conditions. So first and foremost, legacy with, or integration with legacy storage systems. The ability to manage file block and object as well. Object is one of those trends that continues to gain some steam, go a little quiet. Most recently, it's gained uh, a lot of interest uh, amongst not just vendors, but the, uh, the marketplace as well from customers. Uh, certainly support com uh, commercial off-the-shelf, um, as well as integration with, with uh, hyper-convergent cloud environments. Again, support for SMIS, SMP, open API support, those are kind of given, but you have to have those in order to get the, the uh, management orchestration layer. And then storage policy management capabilities. So again, being able to go and, and manipulate and control the data and move the data. And I, ma I mentioned management and orchestration, also the ability to manage stored services. And again, lastly, have those professional services in place so that you can do the planning integration and deployment. If you have all those capabilities, a lot of vendors have those today that they offer, then certainly you've got, uh, you've got the ability to go out there with a full complement and portfolio. Um, our recommendations right now is to provide deeper integration with the storage data path, extend control so that you have that ability to get deeper in and move that around, as well as extended support for unified, so beyond file and block to object as well. Hi everyone, this is Christian Perry, Practice Manager here at TBR for Data Center, and I'll be your host for today's Q&A session. Stan, first question. I've seen the proprietary aspect of SDS, but what about SDS with API-enabled hardware and OpenStack? So again, that's a great question, Christian. Again, as I mentioned uh, previously, if you've got integration uh, with the APIs, um, certainly, that level of integration now gives you access into uh, the data path. Again, it's going to boil down to the level of controls you have, what's your ability to create the volumes, to expand the volumes, what's your ability to provision those out, thick or thin provision, your ability to create the snapshots at that device layer. As long as you have that capability, then certainly. I think OpenStack is making some great uh, headway in uh, in the uh, storage management arena, I think it still has a ways to go, but certainly um, it brings you some of those capabilities. Thanks, Stan. And just as a reminder, you can submit questions uh, using the Q&A function at the top of the WebEx window. Next question. In what types of environments do you see software-defined storage taking hold in the next year? So certainly I see software defined playing a, a huge role in, in hyper-converged infrastructures. As I mentioned earlier, there's a number of vendors that have, have uh, evolved from being a software defined storage vendor to providing more integrated solutions. I say that because again, as we've seen um, and we've talked to customers out there with the traction of convergence and now hyper-converged, um, software defined for them was something that wasn't as easily deployed and enabled as it is buying a, an integrated infrastructure that has your server storage and networking and is being managed and controlled by your, your, uh, your, your software plane. So certainly that's one aspect. And I think another aspect is if indeed we can continue to evolve so software defined storage, you will see uh, specific verticals and specific enterprise customers uh, that will gravitate to software defined as it will help them more economically manage their storage infrastructures. Thanks, Dan. Next question. 
Which traditional storage architectures will be most impacted by SDS and which vendors? So I think right now certainly um, for, for, for those uh, environments that have hard disk drive storage today, um, software-defined storage can actually help to gain a couple more years out of those architectures, um, especially if it can support the unique requirements of that customer's uh, IT environment. Um, I certainly think that it can help with that, but however, software-defined storage really is for uh, the emerging storage architectures uh, like uh, your hyperconverged infrastructure is driven by flash as well as your commercial off-the-shelf. I think for software-defined storage, when you look at your legacy storage vendors, the guys that have been out there selling the iron, if you will, the hardware, for them it's most important. They've got the, they've got the challenge of maintaining their legacy install base and helping them through these complex times and these challenging times where costs continue to rise. So certainly if they can help them by providing a management platform that eases the complexity and cost, it will help them. Plus, they also have to balance that now with going after new opportunities where technologies like flash storage or commercial off-the-shelf are really impacting their, uh, their livelihood and where they've made their money in traditional storage. So I would say that first and foremost, it's your legacy storage hardware vendors. Thanks, Dan. There's a similar question here. Um, we covered parts of it. There's another part here that, that I'll, I'll touch on. So the question is, um, what impact will SDS have on hardware sales for the next few years? How will the storage vendor sales be affected? And I, I think Stan talked to that. And there's also another component here. Um, and also, will this have an impact on converged infrastructure sales? Um, I, I think that when we look at the, at the evolution of converged, and especially hyperconverged, which we consider to be a a, uh, a sub-segment of the overall converged market, if anything, it's going to uh, help sales of those particular platforms, especially hyper-converged. Um, traditional converged, um, I, I don't think that there's going to be any material impact over the next few years from software-defined storage because we see those, those platforms being, uh, those solutions being uh, deployed from far more of a workload-centric uh, focus rather than uh, challenges, um, you know, on the storage side. For those particular environments where those, those uh, organizations are struggling through things like, you know, inefficient internal management of, of, of processes, um, ineffective management of their storage, that could push for, um, for adoption of hyperconverged, and you know when you consider uh, the, you know all of the various factors that Stan has talked about now being driven into things from an appliance perspective, that really makes an easy on ramp to software defined storage. It makes an easy on ramp to virtualization, um, which we've seen. This is being this this is the the uptake is strong now on the SMB and the lower end of the mid market. We expect that that's going to move upward moving forward. Next question, where do you see the maturity of the main storage vendors in the SDS market? So that's a great question. I think uh, we've seen a lot of, a lot of activity uh, coming out of these camps, especially around software-defined storage, and especially around how their software-defined storage platforms are enabling and enhancing other parts of their portfolio like hyperconverged. Uh, whether we're talking about uh, HP's approach or IBM's approach where they're doing it in-house, or we look at Dell where Dell has some in-house software-defined storage, but a lot of it is leveraging partnerships with Red Hat, Microsoft, VMware, and others. Um, so it's very interesting. Um, and I think from the, the standpoint of, again, um, them having to maintain their legacy as well as grow their, their, uh, their market, um, going after and, and addressing uh, this whole movement towards commodity uh, is an interesting, uh, interesting evolution for them. So I do see that they'll continue to uh, enhance and evolve their storage, uh, their software-defined storage. I think for them, they're going to continue to make entry into the data path, as I mentioned earlier. So as an example, you know, being able to take left hand and three par and control data path and move data around between those platforms 
as well as being able to move it across block file and object. Thanks, Stan. Next question, um, and, and Stan, I can touch on this, and if you have anything to add, please feel free to do so. So um, it seems to me that SDN and SDS sound similar but are quite different. SDN, if I understand correctly, is commodity hardware providing advanced network functionality. SDS, on the other hand, is software managing heterogeneous hardware, right? Uh, yes, so, you know, Stan talked about the nirvana of SDS. And if we look at the nirvana of SDS and the nirvana of SDN, that's exactly, uh, that, that's spot on. Um, and, and, but we, that's not where the market is now. I think that's where, um, you know, the, 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 the basis of SDN and SDS, that's where, uh, you know, the market wants it to be. Uh, but SDN, um, we're not seeing, uh, you know, we're not seeing pure commodity hardware yet. In fact, where we're seeing a lot of the, the uptake is through proprietary hardware with SDN functions. And you talk about Cisco's Nexus 9000, for example. Um, you know, you have a massive base of, of switch users who are, you know, accustomed to proprietary hardware. So we think that, you know, it's a, it's a, a longer range adoption cycle, certainly for SDN because it's a, uh, you know, on the enterprise side, telecom's a little bit different. That's the, the, the adoption is happening much more quickly there. But on the enterprise side, um, there's, not, there's not quite the push that we're seeing um, for customers to, um, to eliminate their proprietary hardware and bring in commodity hardware and then have that, have that advanced network functionality. Um, as you put it, and, uh, but that, we, we do feel that that will happen over time. And even though some of the, those, those functions are being built into proprietary hardware, um, at, at, the, at the very least it's going to rise, raise customer awareness of what those functions can do. And then once they develop a comfort level around it, then they can, then they'll, they'll be more willing, we think, to bring in, you know, pure commodity hardware, if not white box, into their environments. And SDN, um, it, if, if I heard you correctly, Stan, I, I think that, the, you know, that nirvana would be indeed software managing heterogeneous hardware. Correct. Correct. And I think, again, with respect to software-defined storage, it's really, again, abstracting the, the storage management piece of it that's been provided in a number of storage architectures over the years, whether it's SAN architectures or, or whether it's uh, NAS capabilities, and then bring them all together. And you can, again, either uh, provide software-defined storage as a standalone software that you just load on a commodity uh, platform, or you can put it within an integrated infrastructure. Next question. What are the primary SDS use cases today? Are they, quote, safe, like backup and archiving, or moving to critical workloads? What trajectory does TBR see here? So I think if you separate it a little bit from the standpoint of SDS enabling hyperconverged infrastructures, as an example, uh, we do see that moving towards very specific workloads. Um, and again, I'm pointing that out because that, that seems to be a nice evolutionary path for software-defined storage. If indeed what I said in the beginning was true, and I believe it's true, which is you need a lot of back-end planning to help with assessment and integration and all, that's why you're seeing software-defined storage as part of hyperconverged infrastructure gaining traction. And so for those, yes, we are seeing specific workloads and specific use cases for those. I think outside of that, um, software-defined storage is gaining some traction within cloud storage uh, for cloud providers. So again, your cloud providers are buying and leveraging commercial off-the-shelf and utilizing software-defined storage to go and manage. And in those cases, it could be anywhere from backup to archiving uh, to hosting some uh, less critical applications, if you will. Yeah, so if we're going to talk about what those use cases are, so if we see software-defined storage or elements of it happening within hyperconverge, and indeed we do, um, you know, workloads like VDI, video surveillance, uh, traditional virtualized workloads like Exchange, SQL Server, Oracle, that's where a lot of the, the, um, the adoption is happening now um, around that, uh, although when we, and we do a lot of customer research on that side, we know that customers want to move even beyond those workloads. We expect that'll happen as 
um, as, as hyperconverge enters a maturity phase in, in, in about two years. Um, but for the time being, yes, it is very, uh, it, it's, it's workload by workload. Um, and so from that perspective, perspective, it is much safer than, you know, enterprise-wide or um, organization-wide. Next question, does TBR have any views on the evolution of proprietary versus open source SDS? Looks like proprietary has an edge today like CleverSafe, but what is the view of the future? Will OpenStack gain the kind of traction and acceptance as Linux has for operating systems? You know, it's funny that this question was asked because I was just talking to a colleague earlier about this and the notion that when you're out there and you're developing any type of software, you're doing it on a architecture, on a platform. And certainly you're doing that for a number of reasons. And so that, that enhances your proprietary approach. Um, I certainly think that that's going to continue to, to, uh, to be maintained moving forward. And I think this, this, from an open source perspective, again, it's going to continue to provide some capabilities, but not to the extent of really looking at what proprietary architectures are going to provide or proprietary software-defined solutions are going to be able to provide. And I think that kind of dovetails into when you're taking a look at software-defined storage. Let me just back up and make it clear that, you know, do we think that there's going to be a massive rush to go out there and deploy this on commercial off-the-shelf or commodity hardware? I think there's a lot of issues there right now, and I think when you take a look at enterprise, you know, they're not going to trade off the value they get from buying an integrated hardened solution from a vendor, you know, that they can rely on from a, you know, 5.9's reliability just because it's cheaper to go buy something off the shelf. I think there's a lot more check marks that they're going to look at other than just what the price is. So I think there is some trade-offs there. Now, again, I think from, you know, a market perspective, there are some other alternatives. I think when you take a look at cloud providers, they're going to bring in that commercial off-the-shelf hardware. They may go through their own hardening process um, before they put it into production. So I do think that it's a couple of things. Proprietary, in my mind, is going to continue to gain, uh, to maintain the traction. You'll get some open source uh, coming through throughout the years, but I think for the most part, it's going to be proprietary. Um, and then with respect to how you deploy those, um, I think it's going to be more integration than off the shelf initially. Next question. SDS with commodity hardware is all very well, but what about the failure rate? Surely it is better to build SDS with reliable hardware and integrate it with your SDS layer using APIs. And there's a question mark, in, mark after that. So. <laughs> Yeah, you agree or not? Yeah. So again, I you know as I, I mentioned a minute ago with with the proprietary and open source question, I think the traction for uh, from a, a hardware perspective is you're going to see more more customers wanting to buy it as an integrated solution. Uh, they're going to want to buy it uh, that's going to uh, be residing in within a legacy environment, if you will, as well. Um, this notion that you're going to just buy it, uh, you're, you're going to go ahead and buy commodity off the shelf, and you're going to go ahead and put SDS on top of that, um, it, to me, it's just, it's not the likelihood today. It's more likely that you'll buy it as an integrated solution where it's already been uh, hardened, if you will, and the failure rate isn't what it would be um, with the former. Next question, how do you see the role of storage administrator changing as a result of SDS? How should vendors address this, revolu this evolution? So I think the role in, in IT as a whole is changing, and I think for storage admins, you know, when you take a look at all the trends and what it is impacting the most from a data center perspective, in my opinion, it's storage. I mean, the demand for storage is not going down, it's going up. And certainly, you know, cost and complexities will continue to go up, but as a storage administrator can put forth a, a storage management platform that's going to give them uh, the best alternative to manage their environment, and it's a complex environment, and also provide the capacity planning, provide the chargebacks, provide all of the, the flow analysis back to the business so that they can better understand exactly the impact of not just the storage environment, but the data center and the business as a whole is what's going to help them. And I think for storage admins, and we've seen this in other roles inside a data center, they're going to have to start really playing the role of, of, of almost like a salesman as well. 
I mean, going out there and making sure that they're educating the lines of businesses as to what exactly their role is within the infrastructure within the data center and how they're going to be able to help those line of businesses as they move forward, whether it's handling big data, whether it's handling specific applications and workloads, whether it's talking to them about outsourcing some cloud applications and how they need to handle that on the back end, maybe from a hybrid cloud perspective to handle maybe the, the, the backup and recovery. So I do think the role is going to change. I do think software defined is what's going to help that. And that's why, again, I think there's going to continue to be pressure on don't just provide management for a single device or a single environment. You've got to provide it across the entire infrastructure as it relates to the storage components. Yeah, and I think that, that moving forward, we could even see, and this, this is a little farther out, but I think that we could see the role of storage administrator and sys, sysadmin being rolled up into an infrastructure administrator role where the storage administrator sort of ceases to exist, but those, you know, all of those duties fall under, you know, to Stan's point, this is, this is you know, software defined it is building a, co well, it will, it's, in the, in the, it's in the early stages of building, but it will eventually build uh, a far more cohesive ecosystem that must be managed as such. And if it is managed as su such, those handling those storage administrative functions must also have an idea or if not deep knowledge around the, the server ecosystem as well. Um, the network admin rule I don't see changing a lot anytime soon, but at the same time, you know, as we get into SDN, we're going to see the sysadmin and the, and the network administrator you know, really coming much closer together. And could there be some conflicts there? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, because this is, right now, it's still a bit of a slow burn, and it certainly is on the SDN side in the enterprise. I think that that's good for the customer because it gives the customer a minute to sit back, take a breath, and understand how all these things are going to impact his or her environment. And, and at the same time, that creates opportunity for the vendors here because from a, from a, a consulting advisory standpoint, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity there because there are a lot of questions now. And once adoption starts to begin around um, you know, around the enterprise and, you know, around environments that don't currently have it, those environments are going to, to wonder how best to do it for themselves. So the services aspect um, is going to be very, very strong. Um, we already see it with hyperconverged. Um, services that are being adopted, and I talked about this last week on, on my hyperconverged services webinar. Services being adopted, um, you know, you see all those traditional break fix support services being adopted, of course, um, but you see very strong, um, you know, strategy, consulting, advisory. Customers want to make sure that they're going to do these things in the right way. Um, and the business is expecting IT to do it in the right way because this is an investment and it's a long-term investment. It's disruption. Um, and, and, you know, those, so IT it will absolutely lean on vendors um, to, to ensure that the process is smooth and that the re return on investment is solid. Uh, so, you know, expect that opportunity moving forward. All right, well that looks like it's it for questions. Um, and if we did realize we missed anything, we will follow up with whomever after the webinar. But I'd like to thank Stan and Christian for their time today and thank you everyone for sending in your questions. Um, you can follow Stan as well as TBR on Twitter on the handles listed here. And please check out our pages on SlideShare and YouTube for our previously uploaded webinars. Uh, additionally, before you sign off, I'd like to ask you to take a very brief survey on the webinar today. We're always looking to improve the information we provide and how we provide it to you, so your feedback would be greatly appreciated. Otherwise, we'll leave the chat function open for another minute or so for people to uh, send any last-minute questions or comments. Uh, thanks for attending. Have a good one. Bye.